Pavlov's Classical Conditioning To begin with, it is important to note that Ivan Pavlov did not set out to change the course of psychology. Born in 1849 in Ryazany, Russia, he was raised in a deeply religious family, and his father expected him to follow the path of priesthood. But the young Pavlov found himself fascinated by the natural sciences, especially the ways the body functioned, and chose instead to study physiology. His early years were marked by persistence and curiosity, qualities that indeed would later make him one of the most celebrated scientists of his time. By the time Pavlov was working at the Imperial Medical Academy in St. Petersburg, his focus was fixed firmly on the physiology of digestion. He devoted years to studying the salivary glands, stomach secretions, and the process by which food is broken down in the body. His dedication was so meticulous that in 1904 he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his discoveries about the digestive system. Yet ironically, it was not his Nobel-winning research that etched his name most deeply into history, but a serendipitous observation made while working with dogs in his laboratory. Pavlov had developed a clever method to study digestion in dogs. He surgically implanted small tubes into the dog's cheeks to measure salivary flow when food was presented. At first, everything went as expected. When food was placed in the dog's mouth, the glands responded by producing saliva. But soon, Pavlov noticed something peculiar. The dogs began salivating even before the food appeared. They would drool at the sight of the lab assistant bringing in the food tray, or even at the sound of footsteps approaching the room. The dogs, it seemed, had learned to anticipate their meal. This puzzled Pavlov. For a physiologist, salivation should have been a straightforward reflex to food, not to the mere suggestion of food. He realized that something deeper was happening. The animals were forming associations between neutral events in their environment and the arrival of food. Pavlov, ever the experimentalist, decided to explore this phenomenon systematically. He began with a simple setup. A neutral stimulus, such as the sound of a bell, was introduced just before food was presented. At first, the bell meant nothing to the dogs, they only salivated when the food itself appeared. But after repeated pairings, bell, then food, bell, then food, the dogs began to respond to the bell alone. Even when no food followed, the sound was enough to make their mouths water. In that moment, Pavlov had stumbled upon a fundamental principle of learning, one that would come to be known as classical conditioning. Pavlov described the process in terms of stimuli and responses. The food was what he called the unconditioned stimulus, something that naturally and automatically triggered a reaction. The salivation it produced was the unconditioned response, a reflexive, unlearned behavior. The bell, at first, was just a neutral stimulus. But after being paired repeatedly with food, it became a conditioned stimulus, capable of producing a conditioned response, that is, salivation, even in the absence of food. The once meaningless sound had taken on significance through association. Over time, Pavlov uncovered more nuances of this learning process. He found that if the bell was rung repeatedly without being followed by food, the dogs gradually stopped responding. This process, which he called extinction, 
showed that learned behaviors could fade away if not reinforced. Yet he also noticed that after a period of rest, the response could suddenly reappear when the bell was rung again, a phenomenon he named spontaneous recovery. The dogs could also generalize their response. If conditioned to salivate to a particular tone, they might also respond to tones of similar pitch. Conversely, they could learn to discriminate, responding only to the specific sound that had been paired with food. Although Pavlov was first and foremost a physiologist, the implications of his work stretched far beyond biology. His experiments demonstrated, for the first time under rigorous laboratory conditions, that learning could be studied objectively, measured, and explained in terms of stimulus and response. This was a radical departure from the introspective methods then common in psychology. For those who wished to establish psychology as a science, Pavlov's research provided a model of clarity and precision. The broader significance of classical conditioning quickly became apparent. John B. Watson, the American psychologist often considered the founder of behaviorism, drew heavily on Pavlov's findings. Watson argued that human behavior, like that of Pavlov's dogs, could be understood as a series of conditioned responses to environmental stimuli. This view helped shape the trajectory of psychology in the 20th century, emphasizing observable behavior over unobservable mental processes. Beyond theory, Pavlov's discovery has found countless practical applications. In education, Teachers use principles of conditioning to encourage positive classroom behavior. By pairing praise or rewards with academic achievement, students come to associate learning with positive feelings. In therapy, classical conditioning lies at the heart of treatments for phobias and anxiety. A person terrified of flying, for example, might undergo systematic desensitization, where they gradually learn to associate images of planes with relaxation rather than fear. Advertisers, too, have borrowed from Pavlov, pairing products with music, attractive imagery, or celebrity endorsements to create positive emotional responses in consumers. Even pet owners unknowingly use Pavlovian methods when training their animals, pairing commands with treats until their dogs or cats learn to respond.